I'm Ed Preisler. I'm a Director of Technology Development at uh, Tower Semiconductor. And uh, I'll talk about um, uh, our uh, PIC Foundry process solutions. Um, so uh, the first thing I want to talk about is, is the idea of using a commercial foundry for photonic integrated circuits. Uh, what are the issues and challenges and good things about using a commercial foundry? So first of all, sort of how does how does silicon photonics fit into the spectrum of what you can get from a, from a, from a commercial foundry? So on one end of the spectrum, you have very, very customized processes like MEMS, where it's essentially the customer is designing the process. On the far other end of the spectrum, you have something like what you would get in deep digital CMOS processes, um, where you have very little customization, and really the customer IP all has to do with how you connect up uh, blocks that are predefined by the foundry. Um, Maybe one step to the left is something like a, a mixed signal analog CMOS by CMOS processes where the customer IT is more in how you uh, route uh, the, the P cells and shapes in the, in the process. Now, silicon photonics fits, I think, somewhere in this little gap here where uh, you want the power of a commercial foundry to be able to do, uh, you know, large scale, high volume processing, but you need a little bit more flexibility. So, that's mainly the, the focus of what I'm going to talk about here is how do you how do you fit something that needs to have the flexibility of a silicon photonics process into a commercial foundry? Uh, so um, I promise only one slide of, of uh, uh, advertising here. So I just wanted to quickly talk about what we offer at Tower Semiconductor. Um, our silicon photonics process is called PH18. That's the family of processes uh, for, for making um, uh, photonic integrated circuits. Uh, so we have uh, a, a vast suite of, of uh, passive elements, um, both silicon and silicon nitride waveguides, um, high speed uh, uh, or high bandwidth mock sender modulators, and then of course uh, photodiodes um, for for detection for high speed high speed data uh, detection. Um, we offer um, uh, uh, fast turnaround uh, passive only runs to get all your uh, passive devices squared away and working the way that you want. Although those were shown in the previous presentation, hopefully you can just simulate and. And trust that it's going to be it's going to be correct, but you can do that. Uh, we also have MPW runs, and then finally, um, uh, we have uh, many things on on the roadmap uh, in order to um, uh, uh, to continue to to make uh, more capable processes going forward with our silicon photonics. Okay, so the good about uh, using a commercial foundry for silicon photonics, the good things. Um, well, PDKs that's what we're here to talk about. So PDKs can, um, as was discussed in in in, in several of the previous um, uh, slide decks. Uh, can dramatically reduce um, the design effort and time to market. So uh, versus the traditional way of doing photonics design that was shown at the beginning of the NPI presentation where everything is done from sort of first principles in a sense, um, you can you can uh, cut a lot of that out of the, the design flow with a PDK. Um, another good thing about a big foundry is statistics. Um, so for complicated picks, uh, yield learning requires lots and lots of data. So basically, um, even though you can simulate and get the, you know, the nominal uh, performance uh, pretty accurate um, to be able to see how your pick is going to per uh, perform over time, cross process, across temperature, all that sort of stuff. You need statistics, and that's what a foundry can give you: just lots of wafers, lots of data. And then the final thing is capacity. So, versus a boutique foundry, a commercial foundry, of course, can um, uh, you know can make lots of wafers, so and it's ready to scale with you. So, most large CMOS fabs could probably handle the entire world's current silicon photonics demand without significantly perturbing their business. Yet, as of now, <laughs> so hopefully that'll change over time. Um, but capacity is certainly an advantage of a big foundry. Okay, the challenges with a commercial foundry. So uh, one big one is design rules. So this was mentioned earlier. So verification is a huge issue with silicon photonics. It's much more difficult um, than it is in the electronics world. Um, so having good uh, verification software is key. Um, it's one of the it's, it's one of the most uh, challenging things with, it, with silicon photonics tape in. Uh, another challenge is um, sort of what you can test. It's very difficult to do optical tests on wafer. Um, it can be done, and it's, and that uh, that field is is, is getting uh, to be you know more sort of um, standardized, but uh, it, that's that's a challenge. And then finally, uh, standardized processes. I think a lot of silicon photonics um, designs are used to, um, uh, or designers are used to being able to customize somewhat, and so um, you you have to be able to um, uh, be somewhat flexible as a foundry, but then also the designers have to understand that there's only certain things that can be changed within the process. Okay, so so can we build a process then that satisfies everyone or vice versa? Can everyone just be satisfied with the process we build or something in between? So I, I, I found uh, so far uh, over the um, uh, the course of, you know, lots of tape-ins that we've had on the silicon photonics side that the passes are probably good enough to get started. Um, and then customization of passive devices can be done pretty, pretty in a pretty straightforward way. Uh, photodiodes are also usually pretty, pretty good off the shelf. Uh, you don't need to make a lot of adjustments. But other things, like, for instance, we mentioned modulators. It's very difficult to make one modulator 
um, that is good enough for every application. Um, and you can do some customization, but this is a more difficult thing to customize. Um, so mod modulators tend to be uh, what I think designers spend um, you know, a good deal of their time on with, with pick design. Coupling the light in and out of the wafer is always a big issue. It's going to be different depending on your packaging scheme. Um, and uh, this is also something that's very difficult because the change in the, in, in the input-output requires usually a change in the process, and it makes it very difficult on, on the foundry side. <clears throat> Another thing that's um, uh, uh, sort of customer-specific is um, other things that you need to do to the wafer to get it ready for uh, packaging, light coupling, interconnects with an electronic circuit. And that usually involves some sort of fancy 3D manipulation of the wafer, which is not a standard thing that foundries like to do. Nevertheless, um, it is possible to do things to enable um, uh, those, those types of uh, integration uh, uh, things. Okay, so here's our approach to building a useful P uh, PDK um, using OptoCompiler. Um, so basically, what we've uh, elected to do is instead of sort of black boxing elements and having more complicated elements that the users are, are, are allowed to stitch together, um, we start with very primitive elements um, and then uh, that, that are easy to characterize and model. So there's just a few examples from the OptoDesigner PDK. Just, you know, bends and straights and turns and MMIs, directional couplers, um, et cetera, et cetera. So these are things that, uh, you know, it, 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 there's not a lot of value for the customer to design their own um, because it's just, a, it's just a fixed element. As long as we know it works, they'll use it, and you can kind of just move on to the more interesting parts of the design. Uh, then you build P-cells for each of those things where you expand to as wide a range of parameters as can be reliably, reliably predicted by compact models, but also reliably manufactured. So, so it needs to be... Um, uh, you know, it needs to be manufactured, but we can't have T-cells that go off in some crazy direction that can't, um, doesn't make any sense from a physics point of view or from a manufacturing point of view. Uh, so here's just a, just an image, a, a detailed image of, of a T-cell element um, from the Opto Designer, uh, sorry, the Opto Compiler uh, PDK. Okay, next, um, you have to validate those basic cells with statistical data and feed it back to the model. So basically, if you have a very primitive, simple element, it's very easy to get a lot of data and then see if your models are correct. Um, so we try to collect a lot of statistical data and then feed it back to the models and show, you know, if they're a little bit off. The same as in the electronics world, right? You, you have a FET, you have a, a field effect transistor model uh, based on physics. You go test it out in real life and you, and you come back and say, okay, well, well, how, um, you know, how close is it to what we predicted? And then you fix the model. Then, the, as, as has been shown several times uh, throughout the previous presentations, um, you, uh, uh, you can build much more complicated photonic integrated circuits out of those, out of those primitive components. So you have layout tools to assemble the P-cells into a real layout, as was shown in the previous talk. Um, and then you have this, this schematic view, and these are, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, connected to one another in the Opto compiler uh, cockpit. Um, and, you know, this has also been mentioned a few times, but uh, optical LVS is, is a really nice feature to have. Um, I personally have screwed up some designs <laughs> by not having optical uh, LVS available, so it's, it's great that that's part of the um, part of the PDK. Lots of things. That's, I, I'd say one of the most common areas where you can mess up is, it's not having things optically connected properly. And then finally, uh, you have the, the, the compact models in order to predict what's going to happen um, when you assemble this, this, this schematic. Uh, the other thing is by having these primitive components, um, it enables you to uh, not have to make big changes when you add or change the process. So let's say I'm going to add a new element here. I'm just showing some data from uh, ring, uh, uh, micro ring resonators. Um, so this is not something that's currently in our PDK, but here's some data. You know, we've manufactured this. We've, we've measured it. Um, so adding something like this to the PDK is pretty straightforward. It's just another element. You don't have to uh, adjust these sort of macro scale blocks. It's just it's just another primitive element. And then since if, it, if you can add a model behind it, you can plug it right into all the other elements, and it becomes part of your circuit in the same way that it would be on the electronic side, where you just sort of you know add a new resistor or capacitor or something to your um, to your list of list of devices. Okay. So uh, in summary, um, so I think uh, designers who are used to the flexibility, so silicon photonics designers who are used to the Flexibility of more boutique fabs. We'll have to make some adjustments um, when they're interacting with a commercial fab. There are some restrictions that are probably not there um, uh, in, in those more boutique kind of fabs. Um, on the other side, uh, designers who are used to uh, designing um, uh, in, in standard sort of electronic uh, uh, foundry processes will be surprised at the amount of flexibility uh, offered by a by a, a foundry a commercial foundry PDK. So we're trying to sort of draw a balance between those two those two directions where the designs are coming from. Um, so the, the Synopsys Optic Compiler uh, PH18 uh, uh, PDK um, contains the basic building blocks that you need to build uh, elaborate picks without any black box elements or proprietary IP blocks. So um, as I mentioned several times in this talk, the idea is you've got these standard uh, simple elements that you can assemble into much, much more complicated circuits and, and, and trust that uh, you can simulate uh, uh, you know, a more complicated uh, uh, circuit with, with those uh, 
from those primitive blocks. And then with these basic building blocks in place, um, you can move to uh, new and more advanced, uh, you can add uh, new and more advanced building block features, um, which can be just plugged in um, to add that functionality to the PDK. So this makes the, the, the PDK in a sense future proof. So you don't, you, you don't have to, every time we add something or, or tweak the PDK, you don't have to go back to your, your, your uh, template and, or you go back to your design database and redo everything. It's just, it's just an add on and should not affect what you've done already. Okay. So that's just sort of a summary of, of our view of, um, uh, uh, PDKs from the, um, the, the commercial foundry side. So thank you.